All right, folks, let's get started. Uh, thank you for thank you for joining us today for a webinar loosely uh, outlined as considerations when designing outdoor sound systems. Uh, my name is Dave Howden. I'm Technical Services Manager here with Biamps Loudspeaker Solutions Group, who are a Philadelphia-based uh, group. Um, I joined Community Loudspeakers uh, in 1998, so I've been helping with applications for a little while and handling handling speakers uh, for for quite some time. Uh, myself, uh, along with my my a uh, team of uh, four designers. We all have hands-on experience in live sound, large indoor and outdoor venue sound operation. Um, you know, some of us were installers in our in our prior lives, uh, but a lot of hands-on experience uh, with my uh, my applications engineers, uh, who include uh, myself, uh, John Lufick, Dale Shirk, John Rogers, and Rich Belando, all based here out of the same office. So. If you have questions and you, you call into BiAMP and you're looking for loudspeaker amplifier information, chances are uh, you'll you'll end up speaking uh, with with one of us. So this this webinar is loosely defined as you know outdoor sound, but I'm going to touch on a lot of subjects that are applicable just for distributed audio in sports systems. We're not talking about mega you know mega stadiums and arenas and stuff here. We're talking about the everyday you know everyday stuff we see. You know this is the you know K to 12 or or collegiate systems or you know community uh, type systems just places where we need to reinforce audio whether it be voice music or a combination of for facilities that are involved with some sort of sport uh, perhaps uh, you've installed these sorts of systems before or perhaps uh, you joined in because you're you're kind of, kind of new you know new to you know doing doing audio for you know, sports type venues you know you know sports systems um, I'm going to touch on what uh, we believe are the very important subjects and the things that are going to affect uh, you know affect your systems and affect the perceived performance of them uh, things uh, things are a lot more variable outdoors uh, when we get Mother Nature involved uh, with systems and weather conditions, wind, uh, you name it, uh, compared to indoor systems where we're generally working in a much more stable uh, environment. So these are these are just a lot you know a lot of things that you should be aware of and sh you should prepare yourself for. Um, when when you're uh, you know considering deploying an outdoor uh, sports based system, so first thing we're going to get into is environmental considerations. So we have acoustic challenges that aren't unique you know completely to outdoors. Indoors also we have you know sound attenuation over distance outdoors. You know very often we're projecting long distances and inverse square law will certainly you know come into play. Uh, you know, outdoors just as it does indoors. Uh, we also have something called excess air attenuation of high frequencies. We'll get into that uh, also. Well, we consider frequency spectral shift uh, throughout, you know, a coverage area. Uh, this is this is where Mother Nature really has her fun. You know, the you know the effects of humidity. You know, what does you know wind you know wind do to our, the perceived performance of our systems? You know, how can we try to negate this? And temperature gradients and thermal clients, uh, these uh, neat, neat little thermal pathways that sound, you know, sound uh, can travel through sometimes, uh, often many miles, uh, you know, unbeknownst to us. Uh, we also have, you know, coverage and clarity, you know, challenges that we can, you know, keep ourselves from making mistakes. Let's, you know, you know, just as indoors, let's try to, you know, Aim the loud end at the listeners. You know, let's reduce reflections. You know, and um, minimize echoes. You know, where we can or as necessary, and not create artificial echoes by bouncing sound off buildings and structures. Outdoors, you know, unlike indoors, you know, available mounting positions, you know, may not be ideal. Indoors, often they're not ideal. Outdoors, well, our, our selection is often quite, quite, 
quite a bit more limited. You know, we get to rather than looking at red iron and things of that sort, we're looking at rooftops and poles and scoreboards and other nearby structures uh, that might be suitable to mount our systems. Um, it's notable that venues with a roof or covering or partial covering may have a statistical reverberant field. So, you know, when we start considering, an, you know, intelligibility and, you know, just, you know, how we're, how we're addressing uh, these areas, you know, we want, we want to be mindful, uh, mindful that there still may be, a, you know, maybe, you know, reverb or more than likely it's, it's going to be echoes that we're uh, ha having issues with. There may be local noise ordinances. Uh, that we have to work around. You know, there's some very stringent ones, uh, you know, especially in towns and in, and in certain states. And it makes it, you know, makes it, you know, paramount that we're, uh, we're paying attention, you know, to the pattern control uh, of, our, of our devices. Again, let's try and focus as much of the sound, you know, onto the listeners and keep the spill to a minimum. Uh, speaker level cable losses. Uh, Important subject. There's a lot of there's a lot of line loss calculators uh, out there. Um, in your handouts, there's actually a you know a really good uh, calculator and uh, and overview of how to use that that calculator for constant voltage systems. Uh, that that uh, um, will be very very useful to you. But since Cable runs for outdoor systems can often be much longer. Uh, we do want to take you know our cable gauging and sizing you know into into uh, account early on in the design process. And system durability. It seems like everybody says they've got a you know weather resistant or even some of them claiming weatherproof speaker out there. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of the real metrics of what makes something able to survive in those environments. Now indoors, when we're dealing with you know sports type venues and gyms and natatoriums or you know indoor you know indoor hockey or any sort of a sports space, we do have to deal with the RT60 and reverberation time. Again, outdoors you know can often be ignore, ignored, but indoors we have to pay attention to it. Hopefully our rooms have some treatment. Otherwise, let's just get the get the speakers close you know close to people. Pattern control of devices. Again, with you know, if you're horn loading, we'll keep the sound contained to listening areas and want to achieve a, a high direct sound uh, to reverberant uh, ratio within these spaces. And background and ambient noise, whether you're indoors or outdoors, you know, you may have to deal with it. It could be an outdoor facility next to a, you know, next to a freeway, and uh, that, you know, that can add some challenges and complications. Just like indoors, you got a noisy HVAC, HVAC system uh, that that can create challenges. Also, can't tell you how to solve all of those, but generally. Getting speakers, clo you know, closer to people to get a better ratio of direct sound over ambient uh, is is a good first step. And then we have multi, you know, multi-use spaces, you know, such as you know, such as uh, you know, gymnasiums. You know, we're seeing you know a number of gyms these days, and uh, especially this is like in the junior highs and such, uh, where that will be the main assembly space. You know, we've got a we've got a stage in there, and they play basketball in there. Uh, those usually end up being you know two separate systems. You know, for the sports system versus a stage system, so we can get good localization. But it should generally be treated as two separate systems. So something I mentioned early on is uh, uh, is uh, in inverse square law. Let's see. Oh, got a question here. This is being recorded, and will and we will send you a link uh, to uh, the slide deck and the recording later on. So thank thank you for asking that, Joe. All right, Inver inverse square law or ISL, as I'll probably refer you know refer to it as. Uh, got some graphics here that basically show you know that are basically showing as as we as we double the distance from our source. Uh, for point source speakers, you know, line arrays and some of those technologies aside, uh, our sound pressure level decreases by six decibels. Now, on the other other side of that, to get six decibels, you know, when you double your amplifier output, assuming your speaker has, you know, the headroom for it, you only get three dB more output. Uh, this is this is something that we don't have to worry about as much indoors, but again, outdoors, 
we start projecting a sound, you know, possibly hundreds of feet, it certainly comes into play. And I'm going to show you, you know, just uh, just how much it comes into play. So very important, very important, uh, uh, con you know, concept here, though. So looking at, look at inverse square law and our losses. So if we reference, you know, reference as most loudspeakers do to one meter, okay, one meter away, let's call that, okay, zero loss. We've got, we've got full output. F to two meters, minus six dB loss. Four meters, 12 dB. And we can go on, we can go on down the list. But the quick point, the quick point that I will uh, make here is, that if we're trying to project, say, across a football field or maybe from the scoreboard of a football field, that's going to be a 300 to 450 foot projection distance. And the loss, you know, you know, relative to, you know, how loud it is at one meter when it leaves the speaker, you're you're up there in the uh, you know mid to high 30 dB range. So uh, you need to st you need to start out pretty loud when you're projecting really far. Uh, and an example here, if we have a fully driven speaker that's capable of 124 dB at one meter, you know, we could generally expect, you know, expect, uh, you know, these sort of output levels, you know, for listening 50 feet away and that speaker is being fully powered. Well, what started out as 124 dB, well, at 16 meters away or about 50 feet, we're, we're down to 102 dB roughly. Now, this is considering outdoors, no room gain, no, you know, not, nothing to really help us out. But just to give you an idea, you know, in a little easier to digest form, you know, how, you know, how much loss there is when we start projecting sound really far. And spe speed of sound, uh, we're not going to get too, too deep into this, but in general, at 72 degrees, you know, sound through air travels at about 1130 feet a second or 344 meters uh, a second. Uh, denser mediums transmit sound at higher speeds as you can see some of you know some of the the examples up there were primarily worried about air here uh, but good information but uh, uh, when we have higher humidity air you know we, you know, we could uh, generally surmise that it would be, you know, beneficial, you know, for longer, uh, longer distance uh, sound projection. Lower humidity lowers the density of air, and this, this is uh, where one of our first outdoor gotchas uh, comes in play, especially for you folks that live in the drier climates or areas that, you know, tend to dip down to that you know, you know, 40% or less humidity range, we have to now deal with something called excess air absorption at higher frequencies, which is in addition to inverse square law. So if we look at uh, the attenuation in excess of inverse square law on this chart here on the, on the left vertical scale, we have additional attenuation at, we'll call it, you know, 100 feet or 30 meters, 98 feet, 30 meters. That's, and along the bottom, we have our, our humidity range. And then our various graphs here are showing us the added attenuation per 100 feet at two kilohertz. You can see at 30, at 30 degree, at 30% 30 humidity, it's only about an extra half a dB. Not a big deal. As we move up in frequency, though, four kilohertz, we're losing, you know, almost three. You know, looking at uh, again, 30% humidity, we're 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 losing, you know, an, an extra dB and a half. We get up to eight kil get up to eight kilohertz, though, and things things don't bode well for projecting very high frequencies, very long distances in these low humidity ranges you know even at 40 or 50 percent you've still you know at eight kilohertz you've got three you know you've got uh you know three db four db of excess attenuation on top of inverse square law uh so this is this is something to certainly be aware of you know if you decide to do a deployment where you are projecting you know possibly full band full bandwidth audio 
uh, long distances, you know, 200, 300 feet. Well, it, at six kilohertz, and if the humidity was if the humidity was uh, at 40%, uh, you know, you know, we've got an extra roughly six dB uh, of high frequency attenuation. Now, you can compensate for this to some degree, but uh, just boosting the high frequency until you hit the limiters uh, usually usually isn't the 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 right answer. Managing expectations for you know systems that are projecting sound long distances is probably you know probably going to do better for you in, in in the long run. Another example using three popular products here uh, across the top we've got. LVH 900, R 252Z, and an R dot five, and we're looking at a 500 foot projection distance. Not that I'd use an R dot five to go 500 feet, but an LVH 900 or an R 252. If we're at 20 percent relative humidity, I'm talking to you folks in you know in the in the southwest um, and you know other extremely dry areas. Uh, if we look if we look across the graph of an LVH 900, you know inverse square uh, law, you know only if we have attenuation nine, you know 94 dB, we're at 94 dB. You know look at two kilohertz, you know we're you know we're at 88, you know three kilohertz, we're at 80 decibels. Uh, low humidity really really takes a bite out of your your uh, very high frequency. Uh, range content and again there's not much we can do about it except hope that the humidity goes up you folks in the uh, more humid environments probably don't have to worry about this nearly as much but be aware of this uh be aware of the humidity you know and the you know where you're you know where you're located and, and how it's going to affect uh, the system perception speaker directivity uh yeah, so for those parts of a speaker system which have drivers mounted to a horn, which are many of BIAMP's, you know, community line of speakers are in our R series um, and our and our L series. In general, a larger physical horn uh, gives us pattern control to a lower frequency. A one kilohertz wavelength is about one foot long, 300 millimeters. A 500 uh, Hertz wavelength is a little over two, you know, a little over two, you know, two feet in length. So the size of a horn, particularly the size of its mouth, you know, is a major factor in in uh, determining how low that system has pattern control to. When I say pattern, when I say pattern control, I should actually say useful pattern control. Speaker might be spec'd as you know, 90 by 40 or so, but when you get down into the lower frequencies in a system such as an R1 or R2, the larger mouth of that horn is going to direct more of that low frequency um, into you know, into that uh, tight you know tighter pattern, tighter listening area due to the physical uh, horn mouth size uh, uh, of the system helping us contain the sound, put sound on ears. Uh, Something we also might want to consider, depending on where we're deploying an outdoor system, is how much sound radiation is coming out of the back of the system, or based on the construction of the system, that might help guide us. Also, in a longer throw system, you know, you know, do we want a fiberglass back cabinet, or you know, it's something you know, a polyglass cabinet, you know, as found in the uh, LVH uh, systems, be better and possibly provide a better front to back ratio for low frequency energy if we're worried about the neighborhood behind us. May have seen this before, may not. R2, you know. R2 uh, max speaker uh, on the left cut away and, and an R5 max on the right. 24 inch square, you know, square mouth versus, versus a 16 inch square mouth. If we look at 500 Hertz on this uh, in, a, in a polar balloon, uh, we can gen generally see on the left side at 500 Hertz, and this is Due to the mouth size you just talked about, we are concentrating the 500 hertz energy into a might, you know, a much tighter pattern. And also, if you look behind it, um, there's probably less less low frequency coming out the back of that cabinet compared to the R566 Max on the right. 
It doesn't have a particularly large horn mouth. It's certainly not a two foot one that's 500 Hertz big. Therefore, the 500 Hertz energy is spread out you know, far more because it just does not have pattern control that low due to its physical size. And also we can see that there is more rear radiation out of, out of one of these systems. Uh, the R2 is probably 10 dB quieter behind it in the 500 Hertz range than an R5 is. We can look at this on a directivity plot also. Uh, useful pattern control I generally consider to be about, about the uh, you know, 90 or 100 degree range. You can see the yellow line of the plot where I've highlighted how much lower in frequency we have pattern control. And, and that tighter pattern control also lends itself to increased efficiency at low frequencies because we are focusing more of that energy. Uh, towards our listeners compared to uh, an R5. That doesn't mean an R5 you know, isn't the right choice. It's just good to be aware of where uh, sound containment um, is of the utmost importance. Pick a, you know, pick a, spe you know, pick a speaker um, that uh, contains the sound based on the needs of your installation. Effects of weather, uh, wind shear and refraction. Um, outdoors, you know, we get, you get, oh, I don't know, 60, 70 feet away from a speaker. This becomes, you know, you know, quite obvious with uh, crosswinds, headwinds. You know, depending on which direction the wind is blowing relative to the direction that the speaker is is projecting, you'll you'll hear that, you know, swishing and swashing going on. You place the speaker four or five hundred feet away and start getting you know, cross winds or wind blowing towards it. And there's a lot of things that happen that are beyond our control. And it's you know, beyond, you know, beyond our capability in general to model these in our acoustics uh, problems. So I, our acoustics uh, modeling programs. Uh, in general, we're a big fan of you know, reducing the loudspeaker to, listening, loudspeaker to listener distance to help uh, negate these effects uh, of weather. Uh, if we have a if we have a sound source, you know, blowing, you know, blowing, you know, blowing, if we have a wind blowing across a sound source, you know, it's generally going to uh, refract, you know, the sound upwards and almost, you know, create, you know, create a shadow as it's shown here. If we have a, if we have a stiff wind blowing across our our, uh, our loudspeaker. We also have refraction at, at, at ground level. You know those speakers you're aiming out towards the, uh, you know, towards the uh, the listening area, or maybe just towards a field or across a baseball field or something of that sort. If we have warmer air at, at lower levels, it tends to lift uh, the mid and high frequencies up. Could completely miss completely miss the mark if you're trying to project voice 500, 700 feet. Um, if we have these conditions, whereas the opposite is also true. If we have a warm layer on top and a cooler layer below, and the that the sound, you know, can get trapped, you know, in the lower layer and just kind of and skip across the ground, which may be more advantageous. But again, very unpredictable, and this is something that we need to manage expectations for and understand the science of for long projection systems. It may sound like, it may map like in a program that you can project a thousand feet, but add Mother Nature in, she has other ideas. We also, um, I've experienced this in my in my past, uh, you know, live sound days where doing a show and you get a noise complaint from 10 miles away. Well, it's not that loud here, but you know what's you know what's what happened more than a couple times is is uh, sound will get trapped in in a thermal cline. We'll get as we showed previously, we'll get a, a layer of cool air uh, down low and a and a cool air trapped below a warm layer uh, near the ground, and sound will sound will. Uh, travel you know travel down this and be able to propagate over a very long distance bouncing between the ground and the inversion layer and essentially forming a, a sound channel or waveguide if you will and it's easy easily easy to achieve sound for short amounts of time unknowingly uh, miles away 
And inverse square law does not apply in the same way uh, when we get you know, sound working in these temperature inversions, but a little beyond today's scope. But be aware of these things, you know, these things that can happen. So minimizing loudspeaker to listener distance, you know, goes, it goes a very long way in uh, negating atmospheric effects or you know, effects of weather. Electrical considerations, so signal cable for outdoor use. A lot of this goes for indoors also. We certainly prefer twisted stranded copper. Um, that's let's stay away, let's stay away from, from the uh, copper clad uh, aluminum, the CCA stuff tends not to last as long, especially outdoors. Twisted conductors are, are highly preferred. Um, they can generally, you know, cancel out a lot of the, the, the energy uh, re radiated uh, from themselves, especially compared to straight pulled THHN, uh, often, often preferred by electrical contractors. Let's try and get twisted stranded cable to our speaker runs, especially if they're long. Shielded speaker level cable is rarely required, except in you know very close presence of EMI RFI sources. If there's a cell tower on a light pole or a scoreboard or something like that, or on top of you know the structure you're doing, it might be beneficial to use that um, uh, while, term, you know, while terminating uh, the send end only of it. And speaker cable, you know, speaker level cables rarely. Um, if ever suffer from induced interference, if you're running them in parallel, say up, a, you know, up a light pole, uh, where there may be other high voltage uh, for, uh, you know, for older style uh, field lighting, uh, it's just, it's just not a problem uh, in, in our, in our experience. And general rule of thumb, some like to go for less. Uh, we're dealing with systems that are pretty widely distributed. So let's let's use appropriate copper size. Let's use our copper calculators and, and keep our losses under one decibel for low Z or constant voltage systems uh, with it, within these spaces we're working in. Local codes uh, ultimately are gonna dictate the requirements for conduit. Um, or direct exposure cables. Um, any exposed cables should be UV resistant, such as uh, SJOW. Um, anything light colored, cream colored, white colored, good chance that it's not UV resistant um, in, in, a plain old, in a plain old PVC jacket. Let's try it. Let's try and get our black jacketed uh, UV, UV resistant cable. Uh, it's very, you know, in, you know, in, inherently, uh, you know, resistant to uh, cracking and degrading, you know, over time in, in the bright sun. For below grade cable runs in conduit, uh, we suggest a cable type like West Penn Aqua Seal or similar um, if you might be in a damp environment. And, well, conduit at some point usually ends up getting wet inside. So for those cross field or 700 foot pulls to sco scoreboards, if you have to do that speaker level, uh, you know, certainly consider a premium uh, level of signal cable. In the case of pole mounted, you know, pole mounted speakers, uh, we we see this often, and it's it's okay. People people do it. There's all sorts of installs out there. Just running cable, you know, from the press box straight, you know, straight, you know, straight, you know, straight to the pole outside. No conduit, no nothing. We're just gonna we'll put a, a a lightning antenna up there. But um, you know, if we can't bury the cable, budget for conduit, or can't trench, you know. If, you know, trench uh, because uh, you're the last one. You know, you were the last one there. Uh, consider, you know, there are special cable types that have messenger wires in them to provide support to the cable. It's not just let the strands and the jacket support the weight. Uh, these are off support. You know, often referred to as self-supporting cables. Uh, there's some specs below. You know, for for a belding cable that's that's pretty popular out there and. These are appropriate for you know, take, you know taking the strain off of uh, off of your your signal conductors. So speaking of powering and wiring, uh, wiring, I haven't gotten into amps and such, but I dumped this slide in here. Uh, we have a downloadable guide. I think I put it in the handouts to match up your you know your community speaker system with Biamps ALC uh, amplified loudspeaker controllers. Helps to match up you know by you know 
amplifiers, you know, by you know by a speaker model uh, to our ALC to our ALC lining. It's a good quick cross reference. Also downloadable from the product page uh, should you go there on uh, on biamp.com. 70 volts, 100 volts or not. Uh, we are, you know, we are dealing with it. We are uh, often dealing with systems where we're driving, you know, possibly hundreds of, you know, hundreds of feet of wire. And it's a, it's a, a very common question. And it's about a, it's, it's about a half day class to you know, really get into it. But consider the following, you know, for your high power installations. And also Dale Shirk, um, put together a wonderful calculator that's in the handouts and a presentation that that he's uh, that he's put out there before that will uh, be extremely helpful in determining you know does it make sense to go constant voltage for a system and also just figure out general day-to-day -day cable losses and paralleling and seriesing of speakers in general if power requirements are um, are 400 watts or less per channel. Yep, use it using a constant voltage in in these sports systems, especially outdoors. You know, can make sense. Um, also, if we just have multiple of low tap multiples of low uh, tapped uh, 70 volt speakers on the same channel, yeah, you know, cer certainly applicable. Uh, sometimes electrical isolation is required, or if the speaker runs are really long. Um, you know, sometimes it is off, you know, easier to just overcome the calculated line loss and throw the transformers to the side and just, you know, apply more power. If we've got two, three dB of signal loss, sometimes it could be the right choice just to use that much more amplifier if our speakers are pretty much all at the end of, end of the, uh, the long cable run. Higher voltage. Uh, higher voltage is usually uh, preferable for for overcoming this additional loss or heavier gauge of cable or let's load down you know the uh, you know the circuit less and split it up into multiple circuits if we need every ounce of SPL out of a system on longer runs. Again, grab the, grab the handout uh, handout and the link to the downloadable calculator. Uh, note that it does have macros in it, so your computer system might balk at you when trying to download an XLSM uh, file, but uh, no worries. I tried it out myself. Speaker systems. I think most most of us are quite you know quite familiar you know with you know with Biamp's you know community line of speakers. The R series has been out there for a, a long time. A large majority of them are horn-loaded devices offering the advantages of increased pattern control, but at the expense of some low-frequency extension. Um, I'll usually take pattern control over LF extension, put the sound where I want it. Um, if they really want LF extension, well, let's, let's, let's talk about some subwoofers for a system placed closer to our listeners. We have compact and medium size uh, systems, you know, for shorter projection distances. They're all made of, you know, of, uh, you know, just completely, you know, weather, weather inert uh, materials designed to live outdoors. I mean, we're, we're the best at this. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time. And all of the hardware, you know, the grills, uh, everything is ready to live outdoors in the harshest environments. We have coaxial and triaxial uh, driver configurations, depends uh, depending on your needs. And for the for those uh, working within the European standards, we have EN 5424 for a number of the R series products. Our voice band systems, there's really very few choices in you know the the professional sound reinforcement world uh, for you know for strictly voice-based systems. We have three choices, either with single, double, or four of our M200 uh, mid-range drivers. If you just need to project voice, whether it's you know whether it's you know for part of a primary system or covering auxiliary areas where they just need to uh, hear the voice. Um, we have we have the best choices in the pro audio business available to you. For full range, you know, for full range systems are I series WR outdoor systems, two way, three way subwoofers. Um, 
or polyglass enclosures, you know, for these shorter projection distance systems where the speakers are closer, we're not trying to project 200 feet with a base reflex design typically. Um, these, these systems uh, provide a lot of options and the I-series uh, WRs, those are our go-to subwoofers uh, for uh, deployment with, with sport systems also typically. Our LVH900 is uh, you know, our big daddy of long projection distance. You've got a, you know a score you know a scoreboard system or a, you know a point source or you know possibly even a distributed system in a very large stadium. I'm talking to you, Ohio and Texas folks. Um, you know these you know these would be a very you know a very you know a very good starting point. All horn loaded design, multiple drivers, very high output capability uh, for for the uh, you know for the LVH 900 series of systems. And there's all sorts of other areas we need to cover. Also, we you know in sports facilities, you know. Uh, many of them without, you know, without without ceiling tiles in them. You know, whether it's the restrooms or the concession areas or the ticket windows, walk-up areas, uh, we have a wide, wide range of uh, full range, full range projection systems and horn projectors for those spot fills that you might need around one of these large facilities to keep people engaged even when they're out of sight uh, of of the action, and they can be. Uh, they can be, uh, you know, deployed very, very cost-effectively uh, in these spaces. Moving pretty quick here. Uh, let's see. Try and get get to uh, another question here. If I can get, if I can get, uh, do 70 volt rules apply regarding signal cable for outdoor? Yes, 70 volt rules. Um, yeah, in, in general, I'd say, I'd say yes. I'm not exactly exactly sure what you're asking, but we still have to calculate. We still have to use an appropriate size cable to have a minimum, uh, you know, amount of loss. Make sure we get enough signal to our speakers. We've got to calculate our our nominal impedance, you know, with all the speakers loaded on the line, and make sure that we're uh, using the you know correct gauge uh, speaker cable to feed that to uh, you know, get the SPL we need uh, in, you know, in the particular target area. All right, loudspeaker construction. Lots of people say they have outdoor speakers and it's got an IP rating. Well, that's great. IP ratings are intended for electrical enclosures, not electrical acoustical <laughs> transducer enclosures. Um, and IP ratings for loudspeakers are subjective. Um, you know, us as a manufacturer, we can dictate to, you know, to meet, you know, you know, some IP 55, 56, you know, 58 rating. Here's how you have to use it. Uh, sometimes they call it out, sometimes they don't, but manufacturers, you know, have the opportunity to dictate the exact uh, conditions which will allow it to meet that IP rating. If you look in the small print on a number of speakers, they're talking just about the ingress, which is probably more appropriate on manufacturer XYZ speakers. It's got an IP65 ingress. Well, oh, that's great. I'm glad, I'm glad it'll keep the water out. Um, and they probably even tested to make sure um, that that, you know, that, uh, that that was the case. But um, IP ratings are used for rating two things, protection, uh, from hazardous parts and ingress and contaminants or particulates into an enclosure. It doesn't tell you anything about mechanical impact from balls, how you know how that speaker physically is going to hold up outdoors in the Arizona sun for years on end. You know, is it going to corrode when you put it in your ocean? You know, your ocean side, your ocean side location. How's it going to handle icing and freeze thaw cycles? You know, corro you know corrosive air environment solvents. Any of this, it, IP doesn't tell you anything about that. So be wary of just selecting a speaker based on an IP rating. What's much more meaningful is mill standard 810G testing, which is what most of our outdoor speaker systems here at BiAMP are designed to. And we actually test them, things like salt spray, 
and see you know you know how how they're going to hold up during accelerated life te you know testing you know humidity you know you know is the you know is there going are we going to cause problems you know with with a cabinet or if somebody's got fiberglass covered wood cabinet is it going to heat up and expand and crack well if they did 810g on it it might us, we're not we're not worried about that here we're well well beyond covering fiberglass or wood with fiberglass solar radiation you know you know is it you know is it going to start crack you know cracking and peeling and you know with with the temperature cycling of of, of these systems you know low temperatures you got to test them low you know low to high cycle you know cycling these and stress stressing the components out you know high temperatures you know we need need to cycle uh cycle them also again you know are the adhesives going to hold together you know is the the glue on that badge actually going to uh still still be there so there's a lot there's a lot more things than salt fog for you for your ocean side folks and applications uh, you know testing speakers in these environments and testing them to these these standards i mean this is a reason you should look to buy them for your your uh, outdoor speaker systems because this is a sort of thorough testing that we do that will keep your customer happy and make you look good also for a very long time when you you know, put a, one of our speakers outdoor as you know it's got decades of experience behind building weather resistant speakers mounting and safety considerations this is uh this is this is so incredibly you know incredibly important um indoors generally a pretty static environment easy to mount stuff we go outdoors well the first thing we got to deal with um once we get it mounted is uh wind loading um it doesn't you know generally matter as much you know how much the speaker weighs as to how much force is exerted on an object when you put it up in the wind whether it's you know 10 feet off the ground or 100 feet off the ground because this is going to stress every fastener every attachment point you know on you know on that you know on that system and the effective projected area is a measure of surface area uh, of our speaker that's being exposed uh, you know to the wind and we're looking at that from a specific, generally the worst case direction. Uh, you can you can look in uh, Biomp's uh, cornerstone under community and look up uh, search for IP or EPA, and you'll find a listing of what the EPA uh, is for each of our speakers. Because a proper mechanical engineer um, who is who is approving a speaker be placed on that pole or that scoreboard or that structure is going to want this information so that they know how many pounds of additional force when wind blows from this direction and hits that speaker it's applying to the speaker and the structure that it, that it is mounted that it's mounted to so this is really essential and why you should always employ a professional engineer when mounting systems to uh, structures outdoors uh, so always consult a professional engineer rigging always rig a safety point attached to the speaker not just looped through or around the yoke um, make sure and you know when you're putting docu documents together doing the design you allow for proper safety, you know, safety systems, you know, for outdoor speakers, I mean, indoor speakers also, quite frankly, but outdoors is a much more dynamic environment. And it's all that much more important. And the maintenance cycles, somebody should be going, you know, going and check, you know, checking these systems and the rigging on, you know, on these speakers flown in the air on scoreboards or over people's heads at some regular interval uh, you know a PE can help you determine what that interval needs to be depending on the severity of the environment but uh, it's uh, highly highly recommended uh, use use of third-party brackets to poles uh, you know we want to make sure uh, that they will not void the warranty of the pole in some cases mating of dissimilar metal parts can cause electrolysis causing corrosion when possible, let's get the pole manufacturer to supply compatible mounting tabs on poles. 
And also it's worth knowing that light poles are shrinking diameter as the, tra the transition to LED lighting speeds up and there's less extra EPA available in these structures. Quick example here, this is based on Nevada and 80, 80 mile an hour winds, 50, 50 year mean wind occurrent, uh, occurrence. For an R2, I'm just going to point out this one example here, an R2, 60 feet above the ground with 80, 80 miles an hour wind, that's 159 pounds of additional load when wind's blowing directly into mouth of that, that that structure is having to uh, deal with. Rigging and mounting references, a uh, couple main players here in the States, adaptive Adaptive Technologies uh, makes uh, pole mounting systems which work quite well as polar focus. Uh, both of them make uh, pole mount systems and can do full custom work and are compatible with a wide range of uh, BIMC community, community loudspeaker uh, lines. Uh, so uh, take note of them, good, good folks to know and to help you keep things in the air safely. We also have a simple mount, you know, a simple mounting system, our, our PMB1RR uh, available from, from us, which is compatible with the small R series shown there. Uh, the vo you know, voice systems, the small W series, and also when using the yoke bracket, uh, the DeSono EX and, and DX systems. The PMB2RR, uh, which gives you pan tilt capability is, is compatible with the previous and also with the R.35 systems and the IC6WR family who have wider yoke. Those two systems have wider yokes with, the, with them and they are not compatible with the PMB1RR. Again, for the larger systems, contact a third, con, uh, contact a, a third party to provide a, the needed solution that's safe. Lightning protection. protection um, you might be surprised how how few lightning issues we actually hear every year with all the speakers on on poles and scoreboards and racetracks and things of that sort. A few details on lightning: it's 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 nasty. Um, very high voltage, very high current, uh, very wide bandwidth. Uh, also, in, in a lightning strike, you know, DC to about 100 you know 100 megahertz, and if you're within a half mile of a strike or your systems are, they're definitely susceptible, uh, susceptible um, to, uh, you know, to lightning induced damage. And more often than not, the reason we don't hear about it is because it's the amplifiers uh, that are taking the brunt of this, the silicone, uh, you know, on the output. Uh, properly grounding a, a uh, distributed outdoor system uh, to protect against a, great, a direct strike is, not particularly feasible most of the time, uh, but let's do the best we can, you know, use our surge X or whatever surge protectors or get the system offline when, you know, when not in use. But in lightning prone areas, a uh, couple things, you know, we, you know, we, we can do barrier speaker cables as opposed to running them from the press box to the pole and basically putting an antenna up in the air to catch the energy uh, in the air from even nearby strikes. Um, disconnecting speakers from the amplifiers offers the best basic protection. Um, you know, come up with a you know 120 volt coil, double pull, double throw relay, and uh, put that on the speaker output. So when the system turns off, the speaker you know speakers are disconnected from the amplifier output. Uh, there's no path back to ground for the current from a a, a nearby strike. Uh, Believe it or not, you know, some, some coiled up cable at the amp output in the back of the amp rack, clothesline style, provides inductance and it actually provides quite good, uh, you know, protection and resistance from, uh, from nearby lightning strikes. Um, so consider that as something that's just pretty easy to do and dress it up however you need to. All right, moving pretty quick here. Got a bunch of system design examples. Another thing that was in the uh, in the handout section um, was our uh, sports sound, you know, reference guide that goes over designs, you know, for a lot of you know a lot of a lot of uh, common outdoor athletic facilities. Main guidelines: speaker height matters, just like indoors. Uh, outdoors. Um, 
I, I think he could get away with a four to one uh, ratio, you know, or, or distance from speaker to learn, you know, for first listener and to the furth furthest intended listener. About four to one, you can, you know, generally still maintain, a, you know, would be considered a reasonable, uh, reasonable near to far uh, SPL ratio, considering, you know, we're not in Carnegie Hall. We're just trying to have some sports and have some, and have a little bit of fun outside and in general. Um, plus, you know, plus or minus four or five in in uh, you know distributed out or not distributed, but uh, say a, you know a left right or a point source system outdoors. Generally, generally pretty acceptable. Um, football, you know, football systems, uh, single story press box mounted systems are really popular. I'd say a third of the systems out there are like that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't really prefer to place a speaker, you know, 12 feet above people's heads to project 300 feet across a field. Because if you remember those graphs of, that I showed earlier, it's almost 35 decibels away, you know, if we're going 300 feet across. So if we want to, if we want to achieve, you know, 80 decibels on the far side of the field, well, we're going to have to start out at about 115 decibels on the home side. And with listeners 12 feet under those, it might be a little uncomfortable for the booster club who funded the system. Let's try not to do that, even though it happens a lot and it just has to. Let's try, you know, try and avoid long throw systems um, that are aiming towards neighborhoods and buildings. Hey, the neighbors or kids might not go to school there anymore. They don't care about the game. Uh, but you know, scoreboard systems, scoreboard-based systems. Yes, you can you can effectively you know cover a lot of area. Now we've got that 300, 400, 500 feet of Mother Nature's playground and the variability that that brings with it, along with neighbor, you know, along with uh, higher likelihood of sound going where you don't want it. And also, let's not create those artificial echoes. Let's not get those reflections off buildings, you know, coming back really late, damaging our intelligibility. Um, higher elevation and more down angle, say from lighting poles, uh, left and right of, you know, wide, you know, wide bleacher areas can help um, direct most reflected sound upward and away from unintended areas. If we, you know, if we, uh, have the opportunity to get 60, 80 feet up on a light pole and fire fairly straight down. Well, most of the sound is going to, you know, bounce back upwards aside from the low frequency uh, energy, which is, you know, pretty, you know, pretty, you know, pretty much going everywhere from 300 hertz or so. So knowing what's behind the speaker, whether it's a neighborhood or a building or whatever, to reduce those artificial echoes, minimize those reflections uh, to give us the best chance of clarity in our listening area is key. And again, manage expectations for systems projecting more than about 100 feet. Um, folks that aren't, you know, that are used to a near field experience, if they're transitioning to a, you know, from we used to have, you know, speakers, you know, close, you know, on an, announcer, on an announcer's box or, or score you know, or, or on light poles and the decisions made to go to a scoreboard based system. Well, we're going to have all that variability from Mother Nature. Um, so we need to manage expectations. It may be a more cost effective install and cover more square feet with fewer speakers. But I remember all those points I brought up before about uh, what can and, and will happen. And also, we should determine at some point how loud does it need to be. Uh, 95 dBA is really loud, uh, as far as I'm concerned. And trying to get over the crowd, and rather than just let them have you know have their moment and understand that the announcer might have to wait 10 seconds to make an announcement, is uh, pretty you know pretty you know. It's a concept that could, uh, you know, that could use a bit more drilling into operators' heads um, when, when running these systems where they might not be in the direct field of the speakers. You know, give them a reference monitor. Give them, you know, give them something to gauge how loud it really is uh, is out there if they're enclosed and not in the direct field of the speakers, or if they're speaking and the sound isn't showing up for 400 milliseconds because it's coming from a scoreboard system. All right. Few, these first few examples are are in the handouts and the sports uh, reference guides. I'm just going to make a couple quick mention. You know, a couple quick mentions here. 
traditional system we see a lot of them will do a long throw you know hopefully from a two-story press box you know an r252z across the field or a 52 max and if we don't have really wide bleacher seating we might even be able to use a couple r1s or r5 of some flavor to cover you know the uh the seating area once you get once you get beyond about oh 35 to 35 yard line we we really want the speakers up higher or we really want to start you know going going to the poles because of the distances we have to project and how loud it will be for the folks in the near field while we're trying to reach the ones in the far field um, another idea we could have okay let's let's put the speakers let's put the speakers on the poles um we jokingly call this a Texas headphone system. Big headphones, get it? Uh, projecting from left and right. Yes, there's some there's some time you know time smear in here. Again, it's not Carnegie Hall. We're just trying to do some sports and upgrade them from the voice band only horns they've been using for two decades, and now we're going to a fuller bandwidth system. Sometimes you'll just end up with the left and right pole speakers, and let's let's put that long throw high up also. Uh, when I say high up, boy, I hope it's not any lower than 40 feet, uh, you know, off the ground, um, hopefully, you know, hopefully even further uh, up the pole so we don't make it uncomfortable for the folks below that device uh, getting plastered with the low frequency energy, even if our, we have good horn directivity and we're getting most of the mid highs across the field. We can also fill in, you know, on the press box or the booster club that funded the system. Let's give them good sound. Let's let's put some smaller speakers on the front lip of the press box, whatever width it may be, spaced 15, 20 feet apart. Some R35 coaxes or 3890 R35 3896s. Let's give them some premium sound. When we commission it, let's make sure we delay those speakers uh, to wait for the arrival from the uh, left, right pole mounted speakers if, if, that, if that is the case. If I had another graphic here, one that I, you know, that I'd rather rather point to, I'd have a pole somewhere down here, you know, on the 10 yard line or the goal line, and maybe I'm putting an R252 max on that, throwing down a, uh, a majority of the seating, maybe a wider R2, you know, 66 or or, or 77 covering covering the near field again up pretty high, and let's put the long throw way up there also, and keep everything coming from one point source. And assuming we don't have any buildings we're reflecting off of, this will make for a very you know very uh, coherent system. Everybody hears everything at essentially the same time. Uh, we like we like to do it that way uh, when we can, but trade-offs to every system. Or we could go with our scoreboard system. Again, this you know, yes, if we don't if we don't have a neighborhood, you know, all the way to you know to the right there, this could you know this could be a, a good option. Or if we want a really high impact system, we're going to stack stack up a couple LVH uh, 900 AP systems for a high impact, high directivity system. But still, we're projecting 300, 500 feet, and we got to know where the sound's going uh, once you know once it leaves the stadium, and uh, and uh, manage the expectations for you know for the vari variability of sound due to Mother Nature. Baseball field systems, these are all pretty simple. They usually have two, you know, two-story press boxes. The easiest to install is um, is uh, just to go on top of that, on top of that, you know, announcer's booth. Whether you got seating left, right, center, or only center, or you want to do center, you know, cover your your first third base seating with an R5 or an R R.25 of some sort, and then use a larger speaker to provide some field coverage if if uh, there's a great desire for that. Uh, easy to do. You could also go to the light poles. You know, perhaps there's light poles in favorable positions at first and third base. You could fire back in if if that's the desire. You know, understanding we're going to get some echo uh, left and right. Um, we don't have much, you know, distance to deal with here. Inverse square law is not going to help us much as opposed to a football field where if I put speakers on the visitor side on light poles and speakers on poles for the home side, I'm not too worried about the echo coming back from the visitor side it's going to be over 30 decibels down and it's going to show up you know 300 some milliseconds later so 
alignment for these systems, everything, you know, these sports systems, everything's usually pretty much at a, at a zero point. Um, you're not you're not delaying trying to fix you can only you can only fix one area at a time if you start delaying and it's uh, likely to create you know other you know other challenges oh it's sports work okay, we're inside now uh, but you know these are all the same facilities you know if you're going after the football field hey, maybe maybe they're upgrading the gym also or vice versa so being able to to talk about this stuff at that time with the athletic director of what, whatever facility you have the opportunity at. Gym systems, you know, general 100 foot by 100 foot gym, we're distributing the speakers. We're keeping them close to the listeners. Um, this one, you know, this is in that, that, uh, the download of handouts showing uh, three R.5 speakers per seating section. If the seats are going from uh, basket to basket, more often than not, you're going to need four wide and let's mount them to the available steel and downfills for court coverage. You know, R.35 coax is usually in about a 25 ish. Uh, foot square grid 30 foot square grid depending on where this uh the ceiling steel is down firing provide great floor coverage for sports and possibly you know other other sorts of events within the space and if they want a little thump with the system great put you know give them a subwoofer but don't put it in the middle of the room put one on the home side one on the visitor side in line with the full range cabinets you know centered slightly off center uh, let's, let's keep subwoofers close to people. This also counts for outdoors when we're working in football fields where they want, might want some extended bandwidth. It's, let's keep the subwoofers as close to listeners as we can because they're the lowest efficiency devices we can deploy uh, with the system compared to the sensitivity of our horn load at our series speakers. Containment. All right, some some quick quick examples here. Um, those of, those of you, a lot of states are do stuff in residential areas. Here, here's an example of a system where we need it. the the high school is right in the middle of a neighborhood. Those are driveways right there, and they wanted a full bandwidth system. So how, you know, how did we achieve this? Uh, they had the budget to place poles behind the listeners. Uh, they were only 16 feet tall, but we were able to uh, able to you know line you know line line them up. Uh, a couple of them are forward on uh, press boxes, but and project from behind them and do a really good job giving high quality audio and a, a near field experience. You know, not you know projecting more than about 40 feet, and in general, you know, not bothering the neighbors with some careful low frequency management. Um, for you know, for a system like this, uh, it's not. Cheap, you know, the cheapest system to deploy with the needed uh, poles and such, but it it, sol it solves the problem. Keep the speakers close to the listeners. Natatoriums, one of the uh, one of the uh, nastiest environments, you know, known to audio. Uh, they so often they don't have any acoustic treatment or batting on the ceiling. Again, uh, we're Distributing the speakers, think of it as sort of a large gym system, if you, if you will, but it's, it's got a swimming pool. Um, many natatoriums will have just lower level seating that might be on one side, might be on the ends. Let's focus, let's focus on something horn loaded on, you know, on those, lis you know, on those listeners, either from, either from the ceiling or mounted on the wall from above them. Let's keep them in the direct field and, keep the direct reverberant sound high and not have to run these systems you know really loud if we need coverage around the perimeter uh, perimeter of the pool sure you know more devices usually aim straight down if somebody insists that they you know they really have to have uh, coverage on the water just know that you know you, you hit water it's like hitting a mirror and it's going to bounce it's going to hit a wall hit the ceiling and it's going to come back at you so we we Try not to get into covering the water, but if you do have to actually put sound on the water, just make sure you're planning on placing the speakers not over the water, but over the edge and uh, do it from, you know, just do it from one side. But focusing sound, sound on ears, um, let's not do it from too far away. Let's not try and cover too much area. Um, 
another example, we have a seating up higher, a second level seating, typically, you know, 10, you know, 10, 15 feet, you know, above the main pool area. Again, they get their own system for voice reinforcement. The rest of the system, should they, you know, should they want a, a perimeter system around the pool, run at a lower level, but let's concentrate on, on making sure that the people up in the seating, you know, they, they can hear very well and we'll place our other speakers around the needed listening areas as needed, whether it be rear fire from behind that's most beneficial um, or, you know, from the top or from the top down. Uh, hockey, I think I got a label on the last one wrong there. Uh, comes up that I've never done a hockey example before. Hockey arenas are pretty easy. They can be indoors, they could be outdoors in you know, some parts of the world. Ver seating could be anywhere from all the way around it to a single side. Uh, but it's just like designing a gym. Uh, quite, you know, quite frankly, we have got our, our 200 foot by 100 foot or whatever it is ice sheet and we're distributing, we're distributing speakers. Um, and keep keeping keeping uh, speakers close to the listeners, directly addressing them. With hockey, you want to aim for getting you know getting the sound over the glass. I mean, you've usually got you know 10 feet from ice to top of the glass is usually about 10 feet. So placing the speakers way out here and projecting in, you know, you're going to miss a whole lot of rows of coverage if you don't you know if you don't get the uh, the pattern over the glass uh, to begin with. And if they want downfills, you know, for, you know, for the public skates or for some sort of figure, you know, figure skating uh, or competitive skating or competitive skating, it's very important that everything arrives at the same time. So a glorified ceiling speaker system, just like we did in the gym example, down firing and uh, making use of the available steel, which you see in this space here. I had to, had to shift my down fire speakers uh, down, down a beam, a little quieter at one end, and I drop another one in if they don't want that quiet spot uh, to the left there. But sound on, sound on ears, uh, let's, let's try not to do you know, long projection, you know, let's cover the ice by, you know, firing some speakers at an angle here that's, that's going to hit here, it's going to hit here, it's going to come down here, it's going to go up there and possibly destroy what little intelligibility we had uh, within a space. Wide area paging, notification, whatever you want to call it. Um, these are coming up more and more, these huge soccer complexes. Uh, one thing you could do is string cable to all of the all of the light poles around the space, which is eh, not out of the question if you get in the game uh, early enough. But if you just need a basic paging system, wide area paging, and you can apply this to a whole lot of things. Uh, let's try and go for a large point source system. You know, if we can, you know, give me one one tall pole, especially if it's just the Hey, there's a hailstorm coming, or a severe weather alert, or come, you know, come claim your lost child from a point source. It's not going off all day long. You're not going to get that four to one, you know, D1, D2 ratio with these systems typically. But um, using our RSH and RMG uh, horns, RMGs for the shorter throw, which was a parking lot here, and RSH is covering all these all these soccer fields, makes for a pretty pretty efficient install pardon the sideways uh, SPL numbers, but um, even, even in the near field, you know, from, you know, from, let's see, I think I did about a 50 foot height on these. Uh, yeah, you hit hundred dB, but look, you're, you're still a, a mid to upper eighties out here when mother nature's uh, behaving. So those RSHs and RMGs can be very efficiently used to cover, cover a lot of area. Simpler baseball, these, these are all over the place. Uh, there's just you know a, a baseball and a softball field and a two-story a two-story announcers box and, you know in the middle. Um, I was able to just with two R594Zs get enough coverage on the seating and enough coverage on the on the fields because the uh, the announce position was was far enough away from you know, from both of them and you know 25 feet up. Um, it was it was good enough, and sometimes good enough, uh, you know, gets it gets it done gets it done uh, for you know for these uh, outdoor systems. Then we have the baseball complexes, four fields in the middle. Uh, I zoomed in on the right hand side here. This one's a little bit complicated. 
uh, doesn't doesn't have an announcer's box per uh, you know or close to the home plate. This one had light poles on the uh, east and west and down to the south, but the north fields did not have light poles. Uh, so we put the majority of our speakers on the light poles because we could get the elevation. We had cable paths, and somebody said, you know, to cover, you know, to put an R25, you know, up on the uh, the backstop. They approved the mechanics of that. Said, okay, to cover these couple seating areas here, uh, we were able to do that. And you don't get a lot of isolation between fields. I mean, yeah, we've got a system aim. You know, each field's got an R25 aimed at each small seating area down the baseline, and an R5 aimed out toward, you know, towards the field. Uh, isolation, you know, between these two, it's not great, but uh, it, it got it got the job done, and it gave them a way to individually address, uh, you know, e each of the fields. And uh, coverage here, I say SPL isn't as important as understanding the concept here. Um, we're able we're able to uh, light you know light up uh, the, the listening areas without any problem, and also have uh, some higher SPL output you know towards towards the playing fields from about a 25 foot height for the pole mounted speakers. It's a lot of information in a short time. Uh, didn't didn't uh, you know delve too deep into any of these? Just it's the concepts on how you know how we approach sports facilities. You know more leaning you know to outdoors from you know and a little bit on on the indoor side. Um, aim sound at ears. Use pattern control to your advantage. Understand where we don't want you know don't want sound to go. Let's not create artificial echoes. Let's rig safely. Let's get a program in place to check that these speakers are still still secure. You know, at the recommendation of a professional engineer, how often that that needs to happen. Let's wire it properly. I gave you a cross-reference sheet for amplification to get you know get you into you know the right you know the right you know power and processing. Uh, you know. A lot of these guidelines, you know, it's the basis of almost any, you know, any system design, but, you know, specifically, you know, outdoors, I'm trying to address here. I want to thank you for taking uh, some of your valuable time today, whether you're new to outdoor systems or you just want to see what's new, what was Dave's take um, on things. Thank you very much for your time and uh, have a fantastic day.